This evening, New Year's Eve, 2019, I'm going to relate the uh, story of the Abantara Jataka. That's, uh, in English, it would be the Mango Jataka. And as you're probably aware, the Jatakas take a stylized form in that there are three parts. There's an initial introduction that is called the story of the present, present meaning in the Buddha's lifetime. Then there's the story of the past, which uh, is a tale, generally the longest part of the Jataka. It's a tale from previous ages and one of the characters, usually the chief character, will be a previous birth of the Buddha. And then there's a short concluding section called Identifying the Birth, where the Buddha will identify any characters in the story that are previous births of individuals living at his time, chief disciples or anyone else. So this particular story begins the story of the present uh, with the going forth of the Buddha's son Rahula followed after some time by his previous wife Yasodhara. They both took the robes and entered the order as a Samanera and a Bhikkhuni respectively. And Yasodhara took the... Um, ordination name of Bupa Dewi. Bupa is a word meaning puppet and Dewi is a female form of Dewa and the implication is someone in the image of a Dewa as a reference to her great beauty. And she was staying in a uh, hermitage for bhikkhunis and Rahula, her son, uh, hers and the Buddha's son would come to visit her regularly there and one day he went to visit her and the other nuns told him he mustn't go in to see her she's ill Yasodhara had come down with a bad case of flatulence and was ashamed and embarrassed to have anyone come and visit her Rahula insisted and he went in to see her and he said, Lady, what can I do to help? What do you need uh, What do you need as a medicine? And she said, well, when I was in the palace and I had this kind of complaint, I would drink sweet mango juice and that would always cure it. But uh, I have none here and as a bhikkhuni, I, can't, I cannot go to the market and buy some. I don't know what I'm going to do. And he said, leave it to me, I'll see what I can, I can, how I can get you some mango juice. And Rahula was, uh, at that time he was a novice, a seminara, and he was a disciple of Sariputta, the Buddha's chief disciple. So he went to see his acharya, Sariputta, and he told him the, the problem, and it and Sariputta said, leave it to me, I'll see if I can get some mango juice. And Sariputta had been invited to take the meal and give a talk at the palace of Pasanadi, king of Kosala. So when he uh, went to the palace before the meal, one of the lay followers offered him some mangoes. Then he took them in his bowl and he didn't eat them. He put them away. And afterwards he gave them to Rahula. And Rahula took them and mashed them up and put some sugar in them and took them to his mother. And it cured her of her flatulence. And when this tale was told to the Buddha... He said, this is not the first time that Sariputta has provided 
Yasodara with mango juice. Uh, this also happened in ancient times, and then he told the story of the Bantara Jataka. So in uh, aeons ago, when Brahmadatta was king in Banaris, the Bodhisatta came to birth in a family of merchants. And when he came of age, he went to Takasila to get his education. This is a common uh, beginning for many of these stories. Takasila was a town in the northwest of India, actually in what nowadays is Afghanistan, that was famous for being a center of learning. It's like a great university town. And many of the um, heroes in the Jataka stories, they go as young men, they go to Takasila to get their education. Uh, so he did, and uh, when he returned, he soon tired of the lay life, and he decided to become an ascetic. And he became well established in his... Um, in his practice, and he gathered many followers, and they lived in the in the foothills of the Himalayas and practiced their austerities. But periodically, they'd have to go down into the cities to acquire provisions. This is another kind of common theme in these stories. The ascetics in that time, they weren't like the Buddhist monks. They weren't dependent on alms, they could grow their own food and gather fruits and things, but there were certain items, they always mentioned salt, that the um, that they would periodically run out of, and they'd have to go down into the cities and, and uh, beg for alms. So he was staying with his disciples for some time in the garden of the king of Benares. And at first it went well, and they were honored, and they were fed, and people respected them. But as time passed, he became more well-known, and his practice was very strong. So much so that Saka, the king of the gods in Tawatinsa, took notice. Saka, sitting on his stone throne at the peak of Mount Sinaru, one day his throne grew warm and shook. And this was a sign there was some matter on earth that required his attention. And it's often the case it was some ascetic on earth that was gaining so much merit that Saka perceived he was a threat. This fellow will get so much merit, he will be meritorious enough to become the new Saka, and I will be overthrown, and there will be a new Saka on the, the throne in Tawatinsa. So Saka, in these stories, he didn't always behave what we would call righteously or, or uh, morally, ethically. He certainly would... Uh, go to great lengths to protect his own interests. And in this particular case, he, he, he thought, what can I do to uh, overthrow these ascetics and disturb their, their practice? And he said, I will use the queen of Benares as my instrument. And at night, he appeared in, in the bedchamber of the queen in a glorious form, floating in the air, arrayed with all his majesty and glowing and she was afraid and asked who are you sir and he said i am saka king of the gods and i have uh, come to uh, give you an important message you should know that if you eat a middle mango then you shall conceive a son and that son will grow up to become a wheel-turning monarch and rule the entire world. 
So you must acquire a middle mango as soon as you can. The window of time is short. And he disappeared from that place. So the queen had no idea what was meant by a middle mango. The next day she thought about it and she conceived a plan. She took to her bed and pretended to be very ill. And all her ladies in waiting were fussing about her. And her husband, the king, who was very fond of her, he hadn't seen her for for a, a day or two. He became worried. And he went to her chambers and, and asked, Are you all right, my dear? And she said, No, my lord, I'm not. I'm very ill. I'm fading away. I'm afraid I will die. Oh, my goodness, what can we do? I must have a middle mango. It's the only thing that can cure me. But what is that? What is a middle mango? I have no idea, but I know it will cure me. So the king gathered together all his wise men and counselors, and he asked them, what's a middle mango? And uh, they were all pretty well stumped, but one came up with what he thought was a clever answer, and he said, a middle mango is when you find a bunch of three mangoes growing together. It's the one in the middle. So it kind of makes sense. Okay, well, go out into the garden and get me, get me some middle mangoes. But the second part of Saka's plan was that he used his godly powers during the night to remove all the mangoes from the king's gardens. So there was not a single mango on any of the trees. They were all bare. And when the gardeners went to gather mangoes for the king, they couldn't find any. And they decided these ascetics must have eaten them all. And they told this to the king. And he grew enraged and he says, Give those ascetics a good drubbing and drive them from the gardens. And so it was done. The king's men with cudgels and sticks beat the ascetics and drove them from the gardens. Then an old Brahmin of the king's retinue who returned from a journey and he heard what was going on, he said, no, my lord, that's not what a middle mango is. A middle mango is a term to refer to a divine magical fruit that grows only on one tree deep in the Himawa, that is the northern half of Jampudipa, this land of many magical beings and strange places and oddities. And the king said, well, we must send someone to the deepest Himawa and find this tree. And the Brahmin said, it cannot be reached by a human being. Our only hope is if we could send a swift bird. So the king had in his possession, he had a very great parrot. His parrot was much larger and stronger and smarter than a regular parrot. And he took this parrot and spoke to it, he said, I have treated you very well as you've been in my palace. You've lived in a golden cage and you've been fed on the sweetest rice and, and dainties and the purest water and you've wanted for nothing. Now I have a task for you. And the parrot said, Yes, my lord, whatever you wish. And he said, You must go to the deepest Himawa and find the tree that bears the middle mangoes and bring me one. And the parrot agreed and the king honored him with a meal of fine dainties and he oiled his wings and tail feathers with costly oils and he took him to the window of the palace and released him to fly away. And he beat his wings and flew many, many yojanas. 
until he reached the first line of foothills at the, at the beginning of the Himawa. And he found a colony of parrots there, and he settled down and he asked them, Good sirs, do you know where the middle mango tree grows? And they said, We've heard of it, but we have no idea where it is. Perhaps the parrots in the second range would know. And he went to the second range, and he got the same answer. They told him to go to the third range. So he went to the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, and the final, the seventh range before entering the Himawa proper, the great tableland far to the north. And the parrots there said, yes, we know where the uh, the middle mango grows, but we won't take you there. It's far too dangerous. That tree belongs to King Wessawana and is guarded by thousands and thousands of kubandas and is covered by seven magical iron nets. There's no possible way you could take a mango and survive. We won't even go near it. He said, well, be that as it may, I'm in service to my lord, the king, and I promised him I would bring him a mango. If you don't want to go, that's fine. I don't blame you, but you give me directions. So they gave him detailed directions about how to find this tree. And he flew off over many many more yojanas over lakes and rivers and hills and forests. And he came to the Golden Mount, this beautiful hill. And on the top was growing this tree, the middle mangoes. And I should explain at this point who this tree belonged to, which was King Wessawana. King Wessawana is one of the four great kings, the Chatu Maharajika, the Dewas who protect and rule over the world, one for each direction. Wesawana is the king of the north. And he has a reputation of being, as we would say colloquially, badass. He had many, many roles, Amongst other things, he was lord of the Yakas, these monstrous goblin creatures, ogres. And he treated them harshly. He would take Yakas into his service, and they had to serve him as slaves for seven years. King Wesawana was also another one of his aspects as, as the lord of wealth. He loved luxuries, so he would um, set these yakas often to the task of fetching water from Lake Anotata, which is another magical spot in the Himawa. And this water is very pure and has uh, magical curative properties. And he would have them running back and forth from Lake Anotata to his palace, bringing words of water for seven years and many of them died in his service the work was so harsh but if they survived and served him well for seven years he would reward them the usual reward for one of the yaka servants of Vesavana was that he would assign them a place on earth where they under certain conditions they would be allowed to eat people Human flesh is a very great favorite of yakas. There are many variations, but a common one would be, say, a certain tree. Anyone who steps under the shade of this tree, you're allowed to eat them. So they would they would work for seven years for him in the hope of gaining this uh, this uh, boon, this privilege of having an allowable. place where they could uh, consume human flesh. So one of Wesawana's luxury possessions was these 
delicious, magical, amazing mangoes that were called middle mangoes. And they grew on this one tree on the Golden Mount. And he had it very well protected. He didn't want anyone stealing his mangoes. So he had seven layers of magical iron netting surrounding the tree. And around that were permanently stationed a whole army, thousands and thousands and thousands of kubandas. Now I'll explain what a kubanda is. You've probably never seen one. If you did, you'd never forget it. They're very ugly, dwarfish little fellows. And their distinguishing characteristic that's always mentioned is they had enormous testicles. And their testicles are so big that they can use them as a seat. And when they walk about from place to place, they'll throw them over their shoulders to get them out of the way. There were female kumbandas, but I've not found a description of them, which is probably all to the good. In any case, this parrot decided on that he would sneak in at night when it was dark and many of the kubandas were asleep. And he crawled on his belly underneath the uh, iron nets to the root of the tree and he began shimmying up the, the tree. But his tail feathers brushed against one of the net, net and it all started to jangle and make a racket. And the commanders all woke up and they were ferocious and and terrifying and they seized this poor parrot and dragged him out and they began quarreling amongst themselves. One of them wanted to crush him to bits with a stone. Another one wanted to eat him whole here and now. Another one wanted to chop him into small bits and throw him into the stew pot. And they went on in this way for some time and the uh, the parrot, with his fearless nature, he said, Do what you will with me. I will die content. I have died in the service of my king. And it is said by the wise men that anyone who dies serving their parents or their lawful master will take a heavenly rebirth. So I will lose this wretched animal bird form and take shape as a dewa. So do what you will, good sirs. And the commanders then were impressed by his fearlessness and his righteousness and they changed their mood and they said, this is a righteous bird, a courageous bird. Uh, we should let him go. Sir bird, you're free to go. And the parrot said, well, thank you, but I can't return empty-handed. I must uh, I must have one of the mangoes. And the combandas shuffled their feet and looked at each other, and they said, uh, we can't do that. King Wessawan is very possessive of his mangoes. He keeps a track of every single one. And if he comes by and sees one mango is missing from the tree, He'll destroy us all in his wrath. Another attribute of Wesawana is he is possessed of one of the four great weapons. And in his case, the weapon is not a physical object external to him. It's his eyes. When he's enraged with his gaze, he can scatter and destroy thousands and thousands of his kumbandas, like split peas thrown into a red-hot skillet. So the kumbandas didn't dare provoke the wrath of Vesavana. But one of them said, there may be a way you can acquire a mango. It's not up to us, but you can try. Vesavana is fond of a certain ascetic 
he goes to him to hear his his uh, Dhamma teachings occasionally. He lives nearby on another another hill, and uh, every month we bring him four mangoes as a gift from Vesavana. We just brought them yesterday. Perhaps uh, he would share them with you. You can try. So the parrot thanked the the commandas and flew away, found this hermitage where this uh, hermit named Jyoti Rasa was dwelling in solitude. And he told him the story. He said, that, you know, the, the queen is very ill and she needs a middle mango. And the king sent me on this this long journey and mission to acquire one. And the hermit said, yes, uh, this is a righteous cause. I, I will help you. I've got these four mangoes. Let's uh, let's have a, a bit of a feast right now. And uh, we'll eat three of them, and then I'll give you the last one to take back. So they chopped up the mangoes, and they had a, a meal of, of these amazing, delicious, divine mangoes beyond any conception of deliciousness in the mortal world. And the hermit strung a, th- a thread through the last one and hung it on the parrot's neck. And the parrot flew back all the way back to Benares. And he presented the mango to the king, who gave it to the cook to mash up and mix with sugar and give it to the queen. And he honored the parrot with great honors and delicious food. And the queen drank the mango juice but she did not conceive a son. Saka, his purpose having been uh, achieved, his own selfish purpose having been achieved, he forgot all about her. And she never got a son, let alone a wheel-turning monarch. So that was the story of the middle mango, and at the end of it, the Buddha identified the births. He said, I myself was the ascetic who was driven from the garden at the beginning of the story. Sariputta was the hermit Jyoti Rasa who gave the mangoes to the parrot and the parrot was Ananda and the queen was Yasodhara. So that's the uh, the tale of the middle mango and the great parrot of the king of Benares.